David R. here. Today I'm going to talk to you about this book, Rules for Radicals, A Pragmatic Primer for Realistic Radicals by Saul D. Alinsky. This is a famous book. It was published in 1971. It has inspired people like Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. Saul Alinsky was a community organizer and troublemaker. I believe that Rules for Radicals is similar to this book, The Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. The reason I say that is, is because in Rules for Radicals, Alinsky refers to those who have influence and power and money as the haves. And in the Communist Manifesto, those people would be considered bourgeoisie. And then the have-nots that Alinsky calls the poor people, basically, people without money, Marx and Engels would call the proletariat, you see. So there are some similarities here. Another similarity is that Alinsky says the significant changes in history have been made by revolutions. Now, in the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels say that history is a history of class struggles. So they're similar in that regard as well. Also, according to Alinsky, history is a relay of revolutions. Unlike the mythic Sisyphus, this mountain has no peak. It has no top. Alinsky says, knowing that the mountain has no top, that it is a perpetual quest from plateau to plateau. Once the rebels get what they want, they will plan a new revolution, and a new revolution, and a new revolution. But the revolutions have to end somewhere. Now, do they end after everything is burnt to the ground? And after there's just one person standing? And what does that one person do? Does that person, you know, kill him or herself? It seems to end that way. At least that's how I see it. Alinsky says that life and how you live it is based on means and ends. The end is what you want, and the means is how you get it. He says your ethical standards have to be elastic. His motto is, he who fears corruption fears life. In other words, whatever means you have to use in order to get what you want to reach your ends is justified. Alinsky also states that in the politics of human life, consistency is not a virtue. He uses Lincoln as an example. In Lincoln's first inaugural address, Lincoln says he would not interfere with the landowners and their slaves. But then, by the time the Emancipation Proclamation came along, he was against slavery. Alinsky says, men must change with the times or die. That's basically what Lincoln was doing. His ethical standards or his morality was a bit elastic. He was a politician. He didn't really care whether somebody was a slave or not until it became political. And then he did. Now I want to talk about Alinsky's 13 Rules for Radicals. You'll find in videos and books and blogs that most people list these as only 12. But according to the book, there are 13. The first rule, power is not only what you have, but what the enemy thinks you have. Power comes from money and people. The rich have the money, the poor have the people. They have the numbers. He says the poor gain power through flesh and blood. And this is why grassroots movements exist. Because... The have-nots don't have the money, but they have the people. And Bernie Sanders' 2016 grassroots campaign comes to mind. The second rule, never go outside the experience or expertise of your people. When the action or tactic is outside of the expertise of your people, it will cause confusion or even fear. This is why... When a conservative person armed with facts is trying to discuss something with a liberal who is not armed with facts, the liberal person will call that conservative a racist, or if they're black, they'll call them something else. And they'll never 
answer the question. They'll never spout out any facts because they're not good at that. That's not their domain of influence. They are good at shutting people down. They're good at violence, but not really talking straight up facts. Very few liberals can do that. See, because avoiding facts, avoiding discussion of facts, makes the liberal feel secure. This is why agitators agitate. Looters loot. It's what they know. It's what they do best. The third rule. Whenever possible, go outside the experience or expertise of the enemy. Though we see a lot of rioting and looting on TV or on the internet, it still goes outside of our sphere of influence or outside of our expertise. When Black Lives Matter and Antifa riot, it elicits a shock and awe effect in us. No matter how many times we've seen it. Because riots and violent acts produce anxiety and fear in the society. Even talk of defunding the police produces anxiety. The fourth rule. Make the enemy live up to their own book of rules. Alinsky believes that you can kill your enemy by asking them to live up to their own rules because nobody is perfect. Nobody can live up to such high standards that maybe they place themselves on. They will slip up from time to time. And that's why Linsky says, shine a spotlight on it. Make it visible for all to see. The fifth rule, ridicule is man's potent weapon. It's hard to counteract ridicule. It throws people off. It puts them on the defensive. Ridicule isn't only the act of making fun of somebody or laughing at them, but it's also the use of buzzwords like white supremacist or racist. These words are thrown out quite a bit, even though they have no basis in fact. The sixth rule, a good tactic is one that your people enjoy. The way I see it, Black Lives Matter and Antifa enjoy looting and rioting. They enjoy terrorizing people. They enjoy beating people who disagree with them. This is not something they just do because they have to do it. They enjoy doing this, actually. The seventh rule, a tactic that drags on too long becomes a drag. Because people have short attention spans, the escalation has to continue. So maybe people go from peaceful protests and holding signs. That doesn't work. So they escalate. They start making fires in the street. They escalate from there. They start burning down buildings. Or they escalate and escalate and escalate until everything is gone, burnt to a crisp, and everybody is either maimed or dead. Alinsky says... Man can sustain militant interest in any issue for only a limited time, after which it becomes a ritualistic commitment, like going to church on Sunday mornings. The eighth rule, keep the pressure on, never let up. He says to attack from all sides, never give the enemy a chance to breathe. This is why the leftist communist regime is built up of several factions. There are the feminists. There are factions within our own government. There's Hollywood. There's news organizations. And there's Black Lives Matter and Antifa, like I mentioned. There's the education system. There's Google. There's social media. There's socialists, communists, the LGBTQ, and the list goes on. They attack from all sides. The ninth rule The threat is usually more terrifying than the thing itself. Imagination and ego can dream up more consequences than an activist could ever do. The threat itself causes anxiety and produces fear. One must remember, though, fear, the word fear, F-E-A-R, means false evidence appearing real. Until somebody actually does something... There's no use in being bogged down by fear. The tenth rule. The major premise for tactics is the development of operations that will maintain 
a constant pressure upon the opposition. The media does this, and they have the capability of pressuring somebody 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because they have the power. The 11th rule, if you push a negative hard and deep enough, it will break through into its counter side. Nearly every negative attack against you can be turned into its positive with the right tactics. I remember during the 2016 election cycle, Hillary Clinton used the words fake news. Trump took those words and used them against Hillary. Alinsky says, this is based on the principle that every positive has its negative. We have already seen the conversion of the negative into the positive in Mahatma Gandhi's development of the tactic of passive resistance. The 12th rule. The price of a successful attack is a constructive alternative. The communists have an answer for everything. If under attack, just say the opposite of what your enemy is saying, but always have an answer. Alinsky says you can't run the risk of being trapped into agreement with your enemy. Poke holes in their argument. If your enemy says the sky is blue, and even if you know it's blue, you have to say it's green or something else. You just say the opposite of what your enemy is saying. The 13th rule. Pick the target, freeze it, personalize it, and polarize it. Don't let your enemy get sympathy from the media or the public. Isolate your enemy from the population. Isolate his message and freeze the opposition. Blame your enemy for every evil in society. Constantly shift responsibility. Basically, blame your enemy for what you do. If you decide to rig an election, say your enemy is rigging the election. In conclusion, I suggest you read both of these books side by side, together, back to back, whichever. Because the way to get to know your enemy is you have to study your enemy. I use books. I use videos. But you may find another way to get to know your enemy. Anyway, that's all I got. Talk to you later. Bye.